Absolutely. Let's go. Okay. Well, welcome to the Energizing America podcast, where we talk all things energy and why we need it in our business and our lives and our communities. Excited to sit down with David Blackman this morning and discuss energy and especially the oil and gas industry and renewables. And David, I, I understand you do a lot of writing for Forbes and other folks. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an energy contributor for Forbes uh, on their website. I uh, have been doing that for about 10 years now. Before that, I'd written at various other publications. I've uh, been writing about energy for 35 years. I'm also the editor for Shale Magazine, which is a publication based out of San Antonio that covers the landscape uh, in America's shale industry and, uh, and also co-host of a radio program here in Texas called uh, In the Oil Patch Radio Show. So why, why oil and gas? What, you got, what, what got your interest in oil and gas? Well, I, I grew up in the 60s uh, in a farming family, a uh, little farm in Goliad County in South Texas, uh, where there was always some oil and gas activity going on around us. Uh, nothing big ever on us, unfortunately. Um, and it was always something I was uh, very interested in and fascinated with. I, I worked in the oil field as a, as a roughneck during two summers in, in my uh, college years. And uh, so got a, an understanding of how things work, uh, you know, the hard work that's involved. And, um, you know, when I got out of college, my first job was with Coastal States Oil and Gas run by Oscar Wilde, a famous oil man. And uh, I spent my whole career in the industry, 40 years, and um, kind of semi-retired in 2016. But, uh, you know, I'm still doing some consulting and uh, a lot of writing about it, so. So as, you, as you've been doing these radio programs, which I've listened into a few and I've read a lot of your writings and followed you on LinkedIn for a while, or is there something that has really stuck out to you in 2022, a change in the industry compared to when you got your start in the industry several, several years back? Oh, what? sure. Yeah. Uh, lots of things have changed. Uh, the environmental stewardship has gotten so much better for one thing. Uh, the industry makes more of an effort to effectively communicate about itself than it used to. And, and that's a, a wonderful change. Uh, they're still not very good at it, but get, getting better all the time. Um, but, you know, the main thing I think that's changed this year, especially in the shale part of the industry, uh, is the focus, uh, the new focus on not, you know, allocation of capital to towards and uh, higher returns to investors, uh, conserv conserving cash flow, free cash flow, uh, and not focusing so much on increasing drilling programs, even in, in this time of very high commodity prices. And that's, uh, you know, come about as a result of pressure from investors. And uh, I think probably is a healthy change for the shale part of the business. Well, for one thing, it, it definitely brings some stability to an otherwise historically very unstable industry, right? Right. One of my questions is, though, uh, you know, there's a lot of frustration in the community about the high price of energy, and, mm -hmm. and specifically gas prices, right? Oil and gas. And we had Pete Stauber on our Energizing America podcast, and he sits on the energy subcommittee in the House of Representatives. He's a Northern Minnesota congressman. And we tried to pin down what what is behind the high oil and gas price. And you've kind of touched on this a little bit uh, now and especially in your writings, but you're talking about returns to shareholders. And in the media, what we read about is greedy big oil companies. Who <laughs> yeah. are, it's like there's been a disconnect as to who these greedy big oil companies are as though there's a CEO sitting somewhere profiting every time Devon Energy has $1.6 billion in free cash flow in Q1 of 2022. The public thinks, well, clearly the Devon CEO just bought another mansion on some island somewhere. <laughs> but who, who actually is the investor that's demanding the shareholder return? Well, I'm, for the most part, it's just ordinary everyday people. I mean, uh, gosh, uh, millions of Americans are invested in oil and gas stocks in their retirement funds. Um, there are a lot of big investors, uh, institutional investors like BlackRock that are ESG focused and put a lot of pressure on companies to 
to not drill wells and try to restrict their capital flows to that. And they've been very successful in that regard as well. But, you know, for the most part, the shareholders are, are people. Uh, they're, like they're me and you, you right yeah and so why why is the media missing this disconnect in the overall media that, that these aren't some big greedy oil ceos they're they're you they're me they're the california teachers Rep retirement pension plan there are possibly a host of state retirement plans pension plans they could be various mutual funds we i.e the consumers are the ones who are demanding the high return or sure. The yeah. Are. And the, the media misses it because it wants to. I mean, they're aware uh, that corporations are in business to make money for their investors. That's why they exist, uh, after all. But the media outlets like the Houston Chronicle that ran a big hit piece on big oil on Friday, a, a, an opinion article, um, you know, they have an agenda. It's an anti-oil and gas agenda, the, the biggest newspaper in the city that's the capital of the industry. Uh, you know, is very anti oil and gas. And uh, so their agenda is to bash oil companies because they're a very easy target and they, they don't like fossil fuels. And uh, but it's not that they're missing it, it's that they intentionally ignore it. So, so the, the shareholders wanting a return is a new phenomenon. And, and by the way, it seems like that's not just in the oil and gas industry. You look at what's going on in the stock market today. And nearly every industry is waking up to a new reality. And that is that shareholders are putting money into a company and they're expecting some sort of a return from it. Yeah. This is not just oil and gas. Look at Uber, look at uh, Facebook. Many of these companies are now using words that historically we haven't heard in the last 10 years. Free cash flow? Since when? Since when <laughs> is that a thing in the market, right? And, right. and the media is totally perplexed by this as as though they would be willing to give their money to some corporation for a free loan. But but there's more to it than that. I read a piece of yours that talked kind of about three elements of the pricing behind oil and gas, one of which was shareholder returns. One was just trying for more operational efficiencies rather than you know growing production. What are you hearing from the companies and what are you finding on that operational efficiencies? Is it working? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, uh, every company is so much more efficient than it was just five years ago. And they've had to become so, you know, we've had two busts uh, in the industry since 2014. And, you know, if you're going to survive as a company, you, you're going to have to become more efficient just to survive the bust times. And, uh, so yeah, and, and their returns on, on every well, the, the amount of product they're able to recover has become so much better uh, over the last five or six years. As, as they get experience in the rock, you know, every oil and gas play, uh, companies get better and better at recovery with every well they drill because they learn more about the hydraulics and how the rocks work and and, and so their completion techniques and their frack jobs become increasingly efficient. And that's what we've seen in the shell industry, just as we've seen in every previous uh, oil and gas play for the last 160 years. So yes, I mean, everybody's getting better at it. Some operators are more efficient than others, um, but you know the, the industry as a whole has just uh, been in a state of constant improvement. Uh, and today, another and, thing yeah, that's really today. limiting what they can do is is access to to both resources and talent uh, as supply chains get messed up and they're having a hard time finding people to work in the industry. So it's there's a lot of limiting factors right now. And, and to that end, even the efficiencies in the oil patch, you think about in the Bakken in North Dakota, I remember the very first well I worked on, we had over a million dollars in the electrical work. As, as a contractor on, on building this facility, over a million dollars, that same exact pad in today's pricing would be under a hundred, just, just around a hundred thousand dollars for the same amount of work. There's yeah. been some serious efficiencies and better planning and so on that's went into that. When you talk about the supply chain disruptions and the shortage of labor, is there a solution to that? What are we going to do about that in our industry? Well, I, I mean, there's a solution over time. You know, you hope that the supply chain um, issue 
gets resolved over time. Although what's happening in China uh, with all the lockdowns in the Shanghai province, um, you know, or uh, uh, really having a major effect across the world uh, because so much uh, commerce travels through China. All these supply chains go through China. Um, hopefully that will uh, ease over time and, and that problem will resolve itself. But, but the talent issue, you know, is one of, uh, I think, going to be a more lingering thing for the industry uh, just because it has such a, a, a bad reputation with the public, which is, you know, undeserved, but it's just part of, uh, it's one of the outcomes of the industry being so bad at communicating and telling its own story. And, you know, uh, I, I just think that there's going to be a lingering issue in the industry now in terms of being able to find talent to, to go to work. Um, because it is hard work. I tell you, you know, the jobs in the field on a frack crew and, you know, even the truck driving jobs in, in the oil patch are very hard, intensive labor uh, that a lot of people simply don't want to do in this country anymore. And uh, so it's it, it's going to be a, an ongoing problem, I think, for the industry. I, I agree. I think back in, you know, at some point, hard work was on the premise a good thing. And yeah. <laughs> the blue collar workforce was rewarded for that. There was a pride in that, you mm -hmm. know, lacing up your boots and going to it. That pride has been diminished over time with the increased pressure on go to school, go to college, no matter what you do, go to college. And then it's con it's compounded in our industry because now are you not only putting on your boots and lacing it up, which is not highly respected, but you're going into this disrespected industry of oil and gas. At the same time, the people that are disrespecting that industry are using their privilege to drive to work, fly on vacation, heat their homes, do all kinds of things that they've missed the connection that wouldn't occur if we didn't have this amazing exactly that we have. Yeah. Yeah. What are you hearing from your, as you're reading and writing and talking with industry folks, this talent pool has had some serious pressure on their cost of labor. And producers continue to kind of hammer this home that yeah. we need better cost efficiencies. We need, how do we how do we marry this cost efficiency with the increasing cost of labor? Because frankly, that's one way we can talent we can attract talent to the oil field is through money. The other way we can do it is through respect, right? But right. you can only do each one of those so much that incrementally we have to do better. So as cash returns improve for oil companies. And as things continue to recover in the shell plays, are we starting to see service providers be able to increase their costs? Well, I, you know, I think to some extent, but you know, another big factor is the lack of stability. As I mentioned earlier, we've had two big busts in just seven years in this industry in which hundreds of thousands of workers were laid off. And it's like at some companies, it's the first thing they do at many companies. The first thing they do is cut headcount. And so when you're an oil field worker, let's say in the Bakken or the Permian Basin, and, and yes, they're high paying jobs and they're good jobs. But if you've been laid off twice in seven years and been out of work for more than a year at a time, both times, are you really going to want to come back into that industry and give it a third shot? I, I'm not really so sure that I would if, if I was those folks, I'd be looking for something else to do. And so that's, that's a, a problem for this industry that it itself has played a big role in creating. And I, I think it deserves some criticism for that. Always being so anxious to slash head counts as a first measure rather than a last resort. Um, and that's particularly true, I think, of service companies. So, uh, you know, uh, I, I I'm a big fan of the oil and gas industry, but I do do uh, get a little critical of them um, in some respects. But I also think, though, getting back to what we were talking about earlier with the better returns and better efficiencies and more stability, that this focus on returning ca capital to investors rather than, you know, just dramatically ramping up drilling programs like the shale business has done in the past. I think that's going to have an effect of, of making the valleys more shallow and making the highs less high, right? It's going to smooth 
the industry out if they will stick with that strategy for the long term. And I think that over time will allay a lot of the fears uh, for workers coming back into the industry. I, I hope that's how it works anyway. Well, we certainly have seen it within our business as far as being able to provide a more stable environment for our employees. And, you know, the COVID crash was, it was a, a big one-off. Oh, yeah. But, but it was nonetheless a crash, right? We, we definitely had to reduce headcount. But we had learned from the 2014 crash to be very careful about right-sizing our business, you know, for the for the clients knowing that at any point the producers could slash yeah, one of the yeah. one of the things that really wish we could discuss in the industry is how the service providers could do a better job for the producers in the sense of hey let's let's establish a deep relationship where we're going to just even out production we're going to even out crews we don't need to do these wild 72 80 hour work weeks just to keep up with this month's production, only next month to have your production fall off. Three months later, you're calling me asking me for two more crews and you're upset that I don't have two more. Crews. <laughs> right. And and by the way, you're only willing to pay $45 an hour for a man that is strapping up his boots and leaving his family for three months. Yeah. That doesn't work in today's world. And there is a massive shortage of workers countrywide. So if we want to do a better job, I think it requires both the service providers and the oil field producers to come to the table like we're doing with some of our clients in Houston next week and sit down and discuss like how can we both do better, right? Um, right. It's not always about, you know, company A's bid this month is $10,000 cheaper than company B, therefore I'm going to use company A. You may find that if you develop a relationship and use company A, and can guarantee a solid set of work for the next 12 months, like some of our producers are starting to do, you could actually save a lot of money and get yeah. some of that additional efficiencies. And when I think that's about- that's a, one of the real benefits that this new uh, set of leaders in the industry like you, uh, this new group of younger CEOs are bringing to the table uh, a higher degree of focus on long-term thinking rather than just thinking about the next quarterly results. And I, that's a tremendous benefit to the industry. Well, and I, I think we owe it to the American public because it's, it's a piece of the negative connotation behind the oil and gas industry. It right. is a piece of it that is, is full of people who for two years are making really, really good money, buying the decked out pickups, buying the fancy houses, doing all these incredible things, only to fall flat on their face, end up divorced from their wife because they haven't been around her for the last three years or their husband right. or whatever the deal was. There's that, That's part of this negative connotation in our industry that we have to do a better job of overcoming. I think you, you hit on the, the third item of the high oil and gas prices is the lack of investment in the oil and gas industry and the unwillingness of CEOs to just because of commodity prices up to go after these additional drilling activity. Do you see now today oil being over $110 a barrel or maybe it's not quite there, it's approaching. I know it kind of dove last night again. Right. Yeah. But do you expect that drilling activity to increase? I, I'm curious where industry is going to go this year. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, and it continues to just very slowly rise over time. It's been a a slow progression. Uh, We're not going to ever again, I don't think, see uh, rig counts like 1,900 active rigs like we had in 2013 and 2014. Uh, But we're over 700 uh, in the United States, I think over 750 now active drilling rigs. And, and I just think that, you know, it will just continue to rise very slowly for the rest of this year. Um, you know, as long as prices stay, stay relatively high, if, if the price should fall back into the 60 and $70 range, then, then I think companies will adjust just like they always do and, and probably slow down their drilling programs to some extent. But it would take a, a fall back into the 40s and 30s for, you know, to really put us back into another bust. And, and the market is so undersupplied right now globally. It's just really, even with a recession, it's hard to see prices going down to that level anytime soon. And uh, I just think we're in, frankly, I think we're in for $100 plus oil prices for a period of years because of the lack of investment over the past five or six years. 
Well, I, I think back in the last 10 years, the difference today and the demand requirements today and the supply constraints of today, if this would have been 10 years ago, the amount of activity, it would be unprecedented oh, to be yeah. so crazy in the oil patch. It would, it would. But I, uh, but I think this feels right. This feels good that the industry is being more responsible and more careful and more prudent as we go forward. You know, there's a lot of talk in the oil industry about ESG, mm -hmm. environmental social governance, and this has really picked up a lot of activity over the last two years. I was at the Bakken conference earlier last year, and it was it was the number one topic. Just like four years, five years ago, the number one topic was pipelines. How are we going to move our oil more safely, right? And now the newest topic is this ESG. How are we doing as an industry with our ESG? Well, uh, <laughs> of course, it, it, whether you say it's better or worse, it depends on your perspective. I, you know, I go back and forth on ESG. I mean, I think it, it's beneficial to some extent because it has. Uh, encourage companies to really take a strong look at, at their emissions, at controlling emissions and cleaning up their operations, finding leaks and fixing them and, and all those sorts of things. But the ESG investor bunch has become incredibly abusive and influential with all the capital they control. And they're the main reason why we've had a half trillion dollar lack of investment in finding new reserves since 2015. And that's why we have $100 oil. So, and we're gonna have $100 oil because it'll take a decade to make up that lack of investment. It, what I, I think it's, it's a public benefit just to the extent it cleans up all the leaks and diminishes emissions. But it's a public detriment because it's largely responsible for the inflation we're seeing in the United States. Uh, every good that goes to market is carried by trucks and trains that run on diesel and ships uh, that run on diesel. And, and so that's a big factor in our out of control inflation problem. And, and the ESG investment firms like BlackRock are largely responsible for that. And so I think there needs to be a reckoning between this industry and those investor groups. And there needs to be a shift in the paradigm uh, away from this effort to keep it in the ground because the world still wants oil and gas and is going to want oil and gas for many decades to come and we're going to need it and we're going to need to be able to produce it and that requires capital so and I, it's a mixed bag to me overall i agree there's there's pieces of it that i love the social piece of it oh boy mm -hmm. put me on a panel and let's talk and about the governance too i think the governance right. piece of it's good too yeah yeah, I, I with Congressman Stauber, I told him last week on my podcast, over $13 million of wages paid. And when those W-2s came off the printer, many of them were six digits. You want a social impact yeah. on a community, start with poverty. You're talking about Carlsbad, New Mexico, where you have folks who've immigrated into the area who are desperate for a solid income. What a great start for them. What a way to transform an entire community, which eventually becomes a whole state to the point that the capital of the state hates the industry, but relies on it for over 70% of its overall yeah. federal fund, right? <laughs> right. So it, it, socially, we can have a really, really solid, good conversation. And I think the ESG, the S&G part, it has allowed the industry to highlight the positives of that. Yeah. And, and now the industry needs to take this environmental piece and really talk about what we're doing as an environmental piece as well. We can do it way better than everybody around the world. So if you're going to have the environmental conversation and you're saying we have to do better as an industry, then your, your only option is to say, I don't believe in this enough that I'm not going to use it. Yeah. Because you can, only, there's only so many places you can get it, right? right? So if you truly believe in the environmental impact, you ought to be getting it from the place that can do it the best. And right. that is right here in our own country. Under our current administration and under the current rules and regulations, there is no place better to do it than right here. Yeah, so no you have two places. Either say I'm done or I believe in the American producers. Yeah. And that feels like that's where the industry needs to come to a reckoning with these investors. That, you know, sure, we all want to do it right, but we are doing it right. Look at the comparables and look at, we have producers who spend over $100,000 a week simply on environmental compliance for a very small field just to right. do leak detection. Every week, that's what they're doing. 
Eight years ago, 10 years ago, we didn't hear about leak detection. Nobody cared about it. The flaring was out of control. We have yeah. made massive strides in the environmental. At what point is the ESG community going to say we're there? Are they ever going well, to? Well, they're not ever going to. And, and that's the thing companies have to understand is you have to be careful how you communicate all of this out and how you invest in it because no amount of, of improvements or investments in renewables, you know, ExxonMobil just got slammed uh, again, by the Houston Chronicle, um, for investing, reinvesting $30 billion in its own stock, right? And, and the line that was used was, well, hey, you know, why didn't you take that $30 billion and invest it in wind and solar and, you know, stuff like that? Well, because they're a corporation and they're in business to make a profit. And they're, they've, they've committed $15 billion in just three years to renewable investments, but that's not enough now, okay? And it's never going to be enough. And, and so you have to, to take the good with the bad where ESG is concerned and, and you should be you know, improving what you do every day. Uh, but you just have to recognize that if you're expecting to get credit from these people, you're never going to get credit for what you do and it just doesn't matter how much you do. It just doesn't. Right. So if if we as an industry talk in a more in a more energized sense, there's a lot of oil and gas has its own subset of industry standards, its own set of corporations. And historically, we think of oil and gas, or I always did anyways, and I grew up in a in going through school that oil and gas equaled bad fossil fuels, we got to get rid of it, and we don't have enough of it, right? right? I never heard the connection between oil and gas and the word energy. And I, I've, I've become more and more passionate about let's marry these two and let's make sure people understand that the only way you heat your home in an affordable, economical way is through oil and gas. It, it, we can't rely on long term. You wrote an article in Forbes talking about the capacity of our grid. We can't oh, yeah. do it without oil and gas. Well, no, I mean, uh, natural gas alone is 40 percent of electricity generation in the United States, nationally. Uh, and, and so what, what are you gonna do to replace that? You're not gonna replace that with windmills and solar panels. They're very limited. They're very low energy density forms of energy generation. Uh, you'd have to cover the whole states of Nevada and Utah to, to, to heat, uh, to power the state of California with solar panels. And that would you only know, work when there's when the sun is shining, right? Yeah, and it only it works eight technology. hours a day, and and the batteries only give you X amount of time for backup. And so what we saw in Texas during that big freeze event last year was wind and solar were the first two forms of energy that fell off the grid immediately, right? Because when it gets too cold or it gets too hot, the efficiency of those forms of energy goes down dramatically. So they're worthless in an emergency, but just for daily generation, you know, they're extremely limited. And uh, we, we've spent trillions of dollars in subsidies for those industries in this century. And they still are generating less than 4% of our uh, national electricity in this country. It, it's just, it's crazy. And I mean, they have a place as part of a well-managed grid uh, but they have to be well managed and properly used and and unfortunately grid managers around this country are trying to pretend they they can be baseload and they can't be baseload so when you you're in texas and you were you were very close to the freeze that occurred a year and a half two years ago when that occurred have you seen a shift you talked about the houston chronicle i'm getting the sense they still haven't embraced the the reality of the situation <laughs> but what about the community has, has, has oh the yeah texans oh sure yeah in the community i mean yeah i mean people understand and in, in my neighborhood i live in a, a little subdivision with less than 30 houses, but every homeowner understands. I, I mean, in, in our little community, I think there's 28 houses here. Uh, six of them bought natural gas uh, generators after that big freeze and, and one house installed solar, which I think rooftop solar is fine. And, and if you have the battery back up, that can get you through a couple of days. And so that's all good. We looked at it too. 
but um, yeah, I mean, people are definitely waking up and, and having a better understanding of why the grid failed, despite the best efforts of the Texas medias uh, to pretend it was all a natural gas problem. Natural gas was the only reason the, the grid didn't collapse completely. And, and, big freeze. and only 200 people died rather than 2,000 people or oh, 200. Thousands people. would have died had the grid collapsed. It would have taken months to get the grid fully back online had it actually collapsed during that freeze. And natural gas at one point was supplying almost 80% of the power on the grid that prevented that collapse. So, um, you know, it's a shame our, our news media is so um, intentionally biased. I mean, it's not a matter of ignorance, it's a matter of ideology. And it's not just in Texas, it's all over the country. But I mean, that's just part of what you have to contend with. Well, and I think, David, we're, we're seeing this across everything. There's there's these extremes in every which way. We were having a family meeting over the weekend, and we were talking about extremes that, you know, when things go poorly, we want to think of all there's There's just extremes everywhere. I actually have solar on my home. I have solar at my business. It accounts for about 50 to 70% of my production and my energy consumption on a yeah, good sunny yeah. day in northern Minnesota. It's great. It will never ever account for a hundred percent of mine because we live in an area that it it can't keep up. So I've just I'm acknowledging that I did the math homework. It made a lot of sense. On we went, but there's this extreme like all in or all out. Everything right. is that way, and and I worry that you know even as commentators in the industry and as professionals, we have to do a better job of acknowledging that like you just did, solar and wind may have a place, a place. Oil and gas may have a place. Nuclear probably has a place. Right. It but all has to be managed right. Right. Yeah. Let's think strategically. I think I read in that article of yours that you're of the opinion that, as a general rule, our electrical grid is pretty well stretched. It is. Yeah. All over the country. Uh, you know, we've we've got problems in Texas, but the, I mean, California has much bigger problems than we have. Uh, the Midwest grid manager was quoted uh, in the Wall Street Journal just yesterday talking about uh, uh, the fact that he doesn't believe they're going to have enough capacity to get through the summer without some problems with rolling blackouts. And you know, the Northeast is an is a incredible mess, in large part because the state of New York has blocked the building of pipelines to take natural gas to the New England states. So at one point in January, <laughs> the New England grid uh, 24% of, of the power generation on the grid in New England was being provided by fuel oil, which it, it produces even more emission, carbon emissions than coal plants do, okay? Because they, they can't get natural gas from 200 miles away in the Marcellus shell. So it's, it's just a, a, a incredible mess due to stupid politics, dumb energy policy, and, and, and the whole country is becoming, uh, we're, we're in real danger, I think, of uh, becoming a second world nation because of this. If we don't stop this madness and build more natural gas power, um, our energy sector is going to be a, an incredible problem for, for decades to come. So how much of this energy crisis that we're in be, and, and we might not, if we're not in the industry, we probably don't feel like we're in an energy crisis. We probably don't like spending $100 to fill our SUV up at the gas yeah. pump, right? But we're not probably making the marriage yet. This is speaking to the larger energy crisis. And I I, yeah. I feel strongly we're in an energy crisis. It's oh, we definitely are, yeah. No, and so no how much of that is because of the political environment versus a social environment, which I don't know how much we can impact. What are we going to well, do? It's all, yeah, I mean, it's all interrelated. You know, the social environment influences the politicians. Uh, the, the, the best virtue signal that a politician has today is I'm in favor of wind and solar. And so any bill that comes across their desk that's going to spend $100 billion on new solar and wind subsidies, they're far. Electric vehicles, they're far. You know, and, and the easiest industry to attack is oil and gas. And so you know, that's what these politicians do. So social media and, and the social climate uh, has a, a, a real impact on the political space. And unfortunately, we elect people with no courage 
to do the right thing. And so we end up in, we're in an energy crisis today. Uh, it's not as bad in the U.S. as it is in Europe yet, but it will be. And, and you know, folks, it just takes a while for the public to wake up to that, unfortunately. Well, Congressman Staubert was quoted as saying that we lack the willpower, the political willpower to have the conversation about energy right. in, in America. And, and I think that's pretty well true, but it starts because the education of the American people is, is lacking. And oh, if yeah. they can't use what's going on in Europe as a real life example of what could happen right here in their own country, we're in a world of hurt. But when we yeah. hear about President Biden talking about Build Back Better, and the electrification of the future. And we just talked about how our grid is already stretched. Where is the conversation about where that additional grid supply is gonna come from? It's totally well, missing. Yeah, it's missing. And, and again, it's all because of, of the pressures from social media and, and the, the news media at large. You know, when you're a member of Congress and, and you know, you know that if you say anything positive about real energy, about the oil and gas industry, you're going to get a hit piece in the Washington Post, or you're going to get a bad uh, two-minute segment on CNN that night. You're going to be very reluctant to do that. But you, but you know, it, when you go out there and make a big speech, you go to the the Ford electric vehicle plant and say, "Oh, look at what Ford's doing! Isn't it great?" Uh, you're going to get a good media day. Well, even if you're a Republican, you're going to be a lot more inclined to go to that Ford plant and do a little virtue signaling. And uh, it, it's just, uh, it all gets missed because of that. And um, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if it can be reversed, quite honestly, uh, be, because of what you mentioned earlier, the lack of education about energy and, and the way our, our kids are really indoctrinated in our public schools these days. I, yeah, that, that's it's a big question if it can be done, but I'm going to die trying. And yeah, we're, me too. <laughs> we're, we're doing some things like even at Westcom that we have a monthly, we call it a monthly solar education class. And we're very uh, upfront about it. We do solar installs in the Twin Ports. We put it up on the board. We got our solar production and we talk very openly about it, that this is a great way to reduce some of your energy costs and your reliance on fossil fuels, but it will not replace fossil fuels. We, do, we don't lie about right. that. We go to the local elementary school here in a couple of weeks and we talk about solar with them and its place in the energy world. And I think we can we can at least try as an industry. When when you're out trying to public or publicize some of these things that you're researching and finding, is it hard to find uh, publications to have your voice heard? Uh, you know, not for me, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, I, I know it is for many people. Uh, and, and the thing is, too, you know, that there's an awful lot of information out there, real good factual information that people can access, be, be largely because of the, of the internet. And, uh, and so it's not that the, 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 the correct, accurate information about all this doesn't exist. It's about the fact that so few people know about it, and uh, I think that's what we have to try to figure out how to do is, is get to a critical mass in our country of people who understand what the situation related to energy really is, and uh, until we can do that, we're, go we're going to have to deal with the silliness that comes out of Washington and in our various state capitals. I, I did a podcast one day with Red River, well, uh, Red River and Riley Sassy, the CEO, told, said, you know, it's certainly not the folks in Washington, D.C. who are going to solve our problems. You oh, know, no. th th that's not it's up to us to do it. So yeah. in, in parting here, what's your advice to the oil, oil and gas service companies? You know, I, I have a couple hundred folks who work at Westcom who've been energized in America between the Bakken and the Permian Basin involved in several different scopes of services for our producers. And as we navigate the ongoing inflationary pressures that are in the business and dealing with our producers, where, what's your, what's your uh, outgoing advice to the folks, my audience, whether they're producers or whether they're service providers, where do we yeah. go from here? Well, stick with it uh, and keep, keep uh, telling your story to your neighbors at church. Uh, stick with it because you're in an industry that is absolutely necessary 
uh, for, for the global society, for the health of our economy and our societies all over the world. And you're in it at a period of time where despite all the, the tales of woe you've heard from me today, uh, you're gonna be growing and because you are in high demand and what you do is in high demand and nothing uh, the people at the Houston Chronicle or anyone else in the news media can say is going to change that. Uh, what you do, the, the product you produce is absolutely essential to the maintenance of, of our society in the modern world and will remain essential uh, until I'm long dead and gone. So you're, you're in it at a great time. I agree. Well, thanks for the conversation, David. Thanks for all your writing and keep up the good fight. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. I really enjoyed the discussion. All right. Take care. All right.